Good evening. Hi, I'm Jennifer Rosado, and this is Rhonda Belosky, and we're two of the counselors at the senior high school. We are thrilled to have such a great turnout for tonight. Um, we're thrilled to have all of you, and as well to have these six awesome colleges represented this evening. Um, so we're gonna tell, introduce the panel first. I saw a lot of notepads and pencils ready. I will tell you this is going to be live streamed. You'll be able to catch the video tomorrow so you don't have to take too many notes. Um, so to introduce our panel, if you could just give a little wave when I say your name from Carnegie Mellon University, we have Miguel Alvarez. From Northeastern University, Nils Lights. From Villanova University, Justin Ledesma. From the University of Florida, Jeannie Sullivan. From Penn State, one of my favorites, Dan Pinchot. And from Slippery Rock University, Michael May. We just wanted to go over the agenda with you briefly so you have an understanding of what to expect for the evening. The first part of our evening is going to be a panel discussion. We've asked each of our reps to be prepared to talk a little bit about their schools, what makes them special, and what kind of students are great fit students for their schools. Then we have given each of them a topic to talk about that has to do with admissions to hopefully help you all as you prepare for your college search and application process. We will be fielding questions from the audience throughout the evening. We have a Mentimeter and they'll be on the side um, screens showing you if you go to menti.com and put in that code, you can then type a question to us and we will um, be able to ask them after the panel presentation and the topic discussion. We do ask for the interest of time that if you ask a question that it not be really specific to your situation but maybe a more global question. If you do have specific questions though, I know our reps are very willing to answer that. Um, if you contact their admissions offices, somebody in their admissions would help you. We also have a college fair this week in Pittsburgh that we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's another opportunity for you to uh, meet and talk with them individually. So with that, let's see. We'll start with Carnegie Mellon. All right, hello, everyone hear me? Yeah, awesome, how's everyone doing? Yeah, awesome. Well, glad you all are here. Uh, really excited to talk to you all a little bit about uh, Carnegie Mellon and share the stage a little bit with these folks. Uh, get to hear from some great colleges as well. But uh, going to go over a little bit of information when it comes to the university, uh, and then we'll go into into some discussion as a group as well. So let's see. Oh, there we go. All right. So first, here you go, here's a little bit of my information. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can uh, see my, my contact information up there. Uh, there you see, that's gonna be uh, the buggy uh, that, that if you ever get the opportunity to hear from anybody that's at Carnegie Mellon, they'll tell you a little bit about our buggy runs that occurred during our carnival weekends. Uh, if you're out there and you are about five feet tall or under, uh, and you do go to Carnegie Mellon, you'll probably, probably be highly recruited uh, to be on one of these teams. So just keep that in mind as you go through this process. So what to know about Carnegie Mellon? I want to go over some, some must-know uh, information about the university. So first off and foremost, uh, can't talk about Carnegie Mellon without talking about diversity as a core value of the university. And when I talk about that, I mean very specifically, uh, this is a, a national global university. We want to be representative of that. Uh, and we're constantly thinking about how to make sure our campus is one that's representative of this nation, uh, as well as one that uh, like it says in our mission, really believes that diversity is a core component to be able to succeed in research in the classroom or in anything that we do. So uh, that's going to be a really important piece of, of some of the work uh, that we get to take part in. Um, something else that you'll notice on our, on our campus is going to be a wide range of perspectives uh, and interests. Uh, you know, we do have a lot of great colleges, and I'll talk very briefly about the importance of colleges with, within the university, but a lot of great colleges from the arts all the way to some of the STEM fields within humanities and then also business. So a lot of great uh, diversity there within, within some of those different disciplines uh, that you can really focus on. 
and then students from around the around uh, the country and around the world. So representative of about usually 48, 49 states, depending on the year. Uh, so we'll get a lot of representation from around the country, and then as well as representation that's really going to be global. Um, so that's going to be really important within within the university. Something else that's vital is uh, research and problem solving. So for us. Something that, uh, that you'll notice is that our faculty and students, they're working on some cutting edge stuff. Uh, so whatever it's in, whatever discipline it's in, it's the type of work that we wanna be able to impact, obviously global issues uh, and impact industries that are really uh, at a very large scale. A little bit about admission, just some must uh, know information. Like I mentioned, the college is really vital. So when you think about Carnegie Mellon, one of the things that's really important is selecting the college that you're interested in. One of the most important things actually, um, because you'll be reviewed by that committee that's particular to that specific college. So really important that you know what college it is within the university that you'll be applying to. So as you go through this process, and if you're considering Carnegie Mellon, definitely important to start to uh, hone in on some of the different options that are available uh, to you. Uh, when it comes to different uh, college programs. And then if you're interested in kind of taking part in that interdisciplinary study, being able to take minors that are outside of your particular program, potentially double major, access any coursework really outside of your core uh, major and core curriculum, Carnegie Mellon's a great place to be able to take place in that. And again, that's down to the diversity of programs that, that we have available. Also a huge aspect though, uh, it's not uh, all just pure academics. We obviously recognize that a big part of the college experience is gonna be uh, what takes place uh, in terms of growth uh, and development during your time there. So if you're uh, really focused on anything from identity development, um, anything uh, when it comes to taking part in clubs, organizations, career and professional development, all of those things, there's a lot of resources on our campus to make sure that students are well supported, uh, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well. Uh, so definitely a big part of, of what we do on our campus. Um, yeah, and that's uh, pretty much it. Obviously, uh, for most of you, hopefully you get a chance to visit Pittsburgh uh, at some point uh, and, and uh, get to visit our campus, which is not too far away from all of you. So uh, hopefully you get to, a chance to go out and see what, uh, what the campus has uh, to offer for you. Uh, hi, uh, I am representing Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my name is Nils Lights. Uh, I'm the one who will be reading all of your applications uh, from Pittsburgh, from Pennsylvania, more widely. Uh, Northeastern being a large university in the middle of a large metropolitan area, uh, we are looking for students who are ready to get involved. Uh, that is something that we are proud of in terms of having a really vibrant campus community in such an urban setting. We wanna be able to make sure that we're bringing students to campus who are actually going to take part in campus activities, who are actually going to get involved with the 400 different clubs and organizations that we have, whether they are athletic, where, whether they're academically based, um, whether they're out in the community around the country, around the world, taking full advantage of the really global network that we have available to us. Some of that obviously takes place uh, out on campus. Some of that obviously takes place inside the classroom. Uh, we do have a commitment to experiential learning on a very grand scale that I'll talk about a little bit, but we also have that commitment to experiential learning on a much smaller scale, on a campus scale, a classroom scale, where we want our students to be able to take what they're learning in the textbook and then put it to use in real time, not only to learn it better, but then also to really figure out what it is that they're studying, how that's going to translate potentially into the rest of their life, uh, into really a lifelong uh, learning experience. Um, in terms of in the classroom opportunities, that translates into small classes. Uh, we are a large university. We have a, about 18,000 undergraduate students and 6,000 graduate students. But with that in mind, we do maintain a 14 to 1 student faculty ratio, which allows us to keep classes small with an average class size of only 24 students, two thirds of our classes having fewer than 20 students. Uh, a lot of them are seminar style rather than you know one person or many people talking at you. Uh, you're having these conversations. You're really spitballing ideas off of each other, off of the professor. Uh, again, diving a little bit more deeply into 
the material that you're covering. But we do have experiential learning on a grander scale. We have four pillars of experiential learning. All of our students complete at least one. Uh, many will take on all four. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory. We have students going to study abroad, whether it's for a full, full semester or for shortened study abroad sessions in the summer. We have students who are doing community service projects around Boston, around the country, around the world. Uh, we have students who are obviously engaged in uh, research opportunities from as early as freshman year, whether it's in the STEM fields or whether it's in the humanities, whether it's in our business school, uh, really across all of our curriculum. Uh, but our sort of crowning jewel of experiential learning is our co-op program. You guys being from uh, Pittsburgh, being uh, sort of in the know about co-op are probably already a little bit uh, familiar from schools that offer it uh, more locally. Uh, at Northeastern, we really take it to heart. Uh, we've been doing this for more than 100 years. Co-op at Northeastern is uh, an integral part of the learning model. Uh, just to bring us all onto the same page, uh, for all intents and purposes, a co-op is a six-month period of full-time work for our students where you are a full-time employee with one of our 3,000 co-op partners. And so you get to go out into the real world, work the same job that you might have gotten after you graduated with your diploma. You get to see if that's something that you're actually interested in. Maybe it is, that's great. Maybe it isn't, that's great too, because you're able to do this as early as sophomore year. So if you need to take a step back and reevaluate your course, you're able to do that. Uh, and again, really utilize your skills in real time to figure out exactly how you wanna maximize your education. And that really ties into, again, the lifelong uh, learning experience that we think we're setting our students up for. Uh, not thinking about college as the end of your educational journey, but more as a transition from more structured learning into the more organic learning that you're gonna be doing for the rest of your life just by nature of being alive, by nature of being a person. Um, but in terms of thinking about things like return on investment, um, at Northeastern we're really big into that. Uh, more than half of our students will actually graduate with a job offer from one of their previous co-ops. Um, and 92% of our students will either be uh, employed full-time or enrolled in a full-time graduate program within nine months of graduation. Uh, we like those statistics. Uh, it really, I think, highlights uh, that ability that our students have to take what they're learning in the classroom, bring it out into the real world, take what they're learning in the real world, bring it into the classroom, and again, set themselves up for success later on down the road. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Ledesma, one of the Senior Assistant Directors in the Office of Admission at Villanova. Uh, though I've been uh, working in the office for about 16 years, uh, this is my first year uh, covering the Pittsburgh area and the rest of uh, Western Pennsylvania. But uh, being told by, by my colleagues, we've had a great relationship with the uh, folks here at North Allegheny. Uh, looking at our, our current student population, I can point out that we have currently five students who used to call themselves a North Allegheny Tiger, and we're certainly looking to build upon that as we uh, continue. So I know uh, if, if you know any seniors at this point, uh, 16 of them are, are, have applied and are thinking about Villanova right now, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, convert some of them uh, over uh, to, uh, to our campus uh, uh, sometime soon. Um, as far as uh, how to get this started, I thought I would just uh, go over some basic information uh, in reference to Villanova. We've been around for about 176 years, so uh, history, tradition, that sort of thing is pretty important to us. We are a Catholic Augustinian University. Uh, you do not have to be Catholic to attend Villanova, uh, but we do have priests, we have religious brothers who live, work, and teach at our school. I would point out on Wednesdays when our students are, are wearing their uniforms, we have worked with many consultants to make sure that these are comfortable, that they're in style, and I'm totally joking, there are no uniforms at Villanova, so <laughs> students, you do not need to worry about that. Uh, as far as other things, uh, let's see. Um, Let's see, we have about uh, just under 7,000 undergrads at Villanova. Uh, the incoming freshman class is targeted about uh, 1,675 students. But when you add our law students, the rest of our graduate pool in there, uh, you hit, you're pretty close to uh, uh, you know, well, uh, just over 10,000 students. So uh, a pretty uh, great community, a smaller, medium-sized university uh, overall. Uh, as far as uh, 
uh, average class size. We tr try to keep things pretty small. 22 is the average class size. 12 to 1 is the student to professor ratio. Uh, as far as our location, many folks have uh, asked me, you know, what it's like to be in the city of Philadelphia. And I do go into Philadelphia quite a bit, but uh, just to be very clear, Villanova is not in the city of Philadelphia. We're about 11 miles away from center city Philadelphia. So I think it's the best of both worlds. Uh, we don't have the hustle, the bustle, the traffic issues that Philly might actually have. Uh, but if we need to get into the city, we can easily access that through cars, uh, through trains, trains that leave right from Villanova's campus. Campus. It's very easy for our students to get there within about 30 minutes, whether that's for a restaurant, uh, to see a play or musical, or for their internships, which we certainly take advantage of with Philly being the fifth biggest city in the country. Um, as far as uh, the campus itself, pretty enclosed campus. It looks like this. Uh, those buildings uh, to the right are our newest residence halls here at Villanova. They opened their doors uh, just this past fall, so we're excited that we're able to bring more seniors back to campus. That's been something that we've been aiming to do with almost the entire senior class being off campus up until this year. But about 15% of our seniors decided to return to campus with the advent of those new buildings. Um, I thought I would describe uh, the students at Villanova by really just taking a quick look at our university seal. And one thing I'm always so impressed about with our students is though uh, access to Latin, uh, students taking Latin, uh, you know, certainly uh, decreasing every single year, our students at Villanova could tell you what these three words mean, veritas, unitas, caritas. They do form the backbone of everything that happens at our school. So the first word veritas, uh, you know, that deals with the idea of truth, and of course we're an academic institution. The pursuit of truth is one of our biggest priorities and our students will pursue truth in 60 academic majors that are organized into five different divisions at Villanova. Liberal arts, sciences, business, engineering, nursing. I would tell you that that's where our reputation certainly lies. We're doing some great things in every single one of those fields. And it is very common for students to double major, to uh, add additional minors and concentrations on top of your primary program. And of course, course, if you don't like what you start off in, students will change their mind and it's very easy to make that happen and still graduate within four years here at our school. Now, one idea that many of our students also emphasize is the idea that truth can mean a lot of different things depending on your own personal perspective. And as we shape and recruit our incoming class, we are certainly aiming to recruit for diversity of thought. So when we look at our students, we're certainly looking for students coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We want a fairly even distribution between the men and women. Right now, it's about 51% female versus 49% male. Uh, I would point out that we want to cover as many states as we can. Our two missing states at Villanova happen to be North Dakota and Alaska, so if any of you have cousins or close relatives who live there, we're looking to complete that set. Um, and certainly it is just a lot of fun. Uh, uh, everything is underlined with a strong sense of school spirit, and that really builds the community at Villanova. So I think when you look at our second word, that is unitas, and that deals with the idea of unity. So once again, about 1,600 students in your freshman class Class, 60, uh, about 6,900 students all together. And I think that is very easy uh, to build that community because almost everybody lives on campus. 99% of our freshmen and sophomores, about 85% of our juniors. And as I mentioned, about 15% of our seniors came back to campus this year. So building that up uh, through that. And I think with that strong sense of community, it is easy to, uh, for our students to really adapt the ideas of volunteerism. And that is the third idea that we'll talk about, caritas. That translates as love or charity. And I think with our students at Villanova, we are always emphasizing to them, yes, become an expert in your chosen field, if that happens to be mechanical engineering, nursing, or what have you. But at the same time, be a good person, be a good citizen. And that's why we're always so proud of all of our graduates because they are community focused, they're involved in their school boards and everything along those lines and that really stems from just a lot of ideas that we really emphasize volunteerism. There are a couple things I can point to. We volunteer in big ways, in small ways. Probably the biggest service project that we do have is our day of service that happens in the fall semester. Uh, this is a picture of how we start off. It starts off on Saturday morning. This year we did it on September 21st and about 5,000 students out of our 6,900 undergrads showed up. You don't have to go to this if you don't want to, but we divided among uh, that group into 150 different service projects. Uh, we went to schools, we cleaned up uh, uh, the, uh, their buildings, we painted walls, we cleaned up parks, we did so many different things. 
things. Uh, another example, of course, is also Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we have one of the highest participation rates in the country, and uh, this is something that we certainly are very proud of. And when you, again, pull that all together, this is underlined with a strong sense of school spirit. A lot of people ask about the sports at Villanova. The basketball team, of course, pretty strong, but we are very good at a lot of other sports. We pulled a national championship down in football in 2009. And small fun fact, uh, running is probably what we're both uh, best known for. Uh, we had about 24 national championships, three belonging to the basketball team, one for the football team, and the rest belong to the cross country and track and field teams. So with the Olympics coming up, I always like to share this idea that you can go all the way back to the 1948 Summer Olympics and you will always find Villanova runners at the Olympics. So uh, it's a great place, uh, a great place to spend your four years and I'm happy to answer some more questions once we get a chance. Hi y'all. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Jeannie, like in a bottle, and I am the <laughs> regional admissions rep for uh, University of Florida. So I cover Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So for anyone that doesn't really know where University of Florida is, we are in Gainesville. So if you would like to go to Disney, you're about two hours north of Disney. We're about an hour and a half away from Jacksonville, depending how fast you drive. I'm a New Yorker, so I make it in less time than that. But you know, a lot of retired folks live in Florida, so you never really know. So when it comes to University of Florida, we are uh, a top 10 research facility. We have lots of opportunities for our students to do research. Just last year, we had over $300 million worth of funding for our research to do, or students for do, to do research. We have over five different facilities all throughout the state of Florida for students to do that research. So my favorite one to talk about is we have one in Miami that does research on lionfish and also dolphins and tide, um, tide levels. We also have over 120 different majors, so a wide variety for students to choose from. When you're applying to UF, you do not have to pick a major because we admit students ju just based on their application, not by major, so no need to worry about that. We also have six different uh, professional programs for students to participate in. We also have one of the largest teaching hospitals in the South for students. We also have a 96% reten freshman retention rate. So that pretty much means is we're preparing our students and giving those resources for our students to be successful within that first year transitioning to their second year. And we do have a faculty staff ratio of 18 to one. We are trying to decrease that one to 15 to one. We are a very large campus. We have about 57,000 students on campus. About 39,000 of that is our undergrad. So we are a fairly large campus, but we do have those opportunities for our students to find research, different clubs and opportunities like that. So we do have a undergraduate research program for our students to participate in. One of my favorite things about our um, research program, but also our honors program, it's kind of built into one. So you are able to have those opportunities. Within the honors program, you do get to have smaller class sizes and things like that. They do have a wide variety of classes. So right now, one of their classes that they're teaching is zombies and the apocalypse and how to prepare for that. Um, but it's a literature class, so it's like, Pretty cool, in my opinion. We do have ROTC, we have four branches, so you are able to participate in that if you'd like to. We do have Greek life for the South, so there's that. Um, but we do have 60, 000, 60 different Greek life opportunities, organizations for students, either cultural, uh, within your major, but also social. So you have those opportunities within that. We also have a wide variety of study abroad programs. So we do have over 300 different study abroad programs for students to participate in. I'll talk about two. One of them, we have one call, called Vampire and Empire. So students go to London and they study vampires throughout literature. So you're like, that sounds really boring. But they look at Dracula and how Dracula was super scary back then and then compare it to Twilight and how everyone's like, oh my gosh, vampires are hot, like bite me. Um, so like looking at how that has changed throughout history and how societal norms kind of shape your view, view of vampires. Also this upcoming summer we're going to have a program for our journalism and communication students to go to Tokyo and it's going to be an internship but also a study abroad. So during that first six weeks they'll be able to take classes and then the last two weeks they'll be doing interviews with professional athletes and things like that so then they can kind of see and apply their field 
within a professional sense. Some fun facts about UF, our big campus, which is kind of in the corner, that area is called Turlington Plaza or Plaza of Americas that has more foot traffic than the gates of Disney, which is kind of crazy to think about, but it does. Um, also, that plaza houses where most of our clubs and organizations happen. So we have over a thousand clubs and student orgs for students to participate in. We have a parasailing club. We have a rock, paper, scissors team. We also have a club where they run down to McDonald's, they eat McDonald's together, and and they try to run home, um, but that's just what they do. Uh, we are also the number one school for scooters, so like mopeds, European scooters, so that's how a lot of students usually get around. Um, but also we are um, third for tech transfer, so really applying what students are learning within the classroom and applying it to the real world. So that's over MIT, Caltech, um, and Stanford, just to name a few. Also another fun fact, two, fu two fun facts. Um, we are the creator of Gatorade, if you didn't know that, um, but we also have the largest bat house in the world that houses just over a million bats. And that's all I got, y'all. How do you follow that? <laughs> You don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, my name is Dan Pinchot. I'm a director of enrollment at Penn State. Um, I'm, I see about 10, 12 faces out there. I think there are more people than that. Do we have any Penn State alumni in the house? Oh, I can't hear anything. So let me try this. We are. OK, I know there are alum here. All right, this is good. <laughs> Uh, I, too, am a, am a proud Penn State alum, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what makes uh, Penn State unique. Um, uh, well, let's back up here for a second, because this, look, she's big on fun facts, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you on a fun fact. Did you know that the Nittany Lion Shrine is the second most photographed thing in Pennsylvania after the Liberty Bell? There you go. People are going to, uh, uh, to all 20 of our Penn State campuses uh, to take a picture in front of the Nittany Lion Shrine. And what a great transition to talking about what one of the things that makes us so unique. Um, we are a system like no other because we are one university geographically dispersed. We, are, uh, we offer the same curriculum, the same classes, but we are able to do that across 20 campuses. Now, when most people think of Penn State, uh, they are thinking of our main campus, the University Park location. Uh, that's the one in the center of the state. Uh, that is our largest campus. It's also our most competitive campus. There are about 47,000 students at that one location. But at our other 19 smaller undergraduate campuses, we have about another 40,000 combined. Uh, campuses range in size from about 5,000 students uh, to as few as 500 students. And, and that's one of the things that really makes Penn State unique is that whether you want big, you want medium, you want small, you can find your place here at Penn State. The other thing that's really important is that uh, we have what's called the 2 plus 2 program at Penn State. And what 2 plus 2 means is that you can start almost any one of your majors at any one of our campuses. And after two years, you are guaranteed to be able to change your campus to University Park or frankly any other campus that offers the final two years of your major. It is guaranteed, there is no worry about uh, the transferability of credits, uh, you don't have to reapply, there's none of that. Um, at Penn State, about, uh, about almost 60% of our incoming freshmen begin their studies at a campus other than University Park and roughly 40, 42% or so um, are beginning at the University Park campus. Uh, those students are most likely to spend all four years there, and I would say probably 20 to 25% of the students that started a campus outside of University Park will finish all four years at the campus that they begin at. Uh, so that's uh, one of the first things that makes us sort of unique. Uh, if we move on, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about all of our majors, because at Penn State, you can study just about anything. Uh, we have 275 different academic majors. And when you couple that with uh, minors and, and the various options within our programs, um, quite literally, whatever your goal is, you can craft that major at Penn State. Um, and almost all of them you can begin at any one of our Penn State campuses. Um, academically, Penn State is broken up into 13 different academic colleges. I'm not going to talk about each one of them. You can see them on the list. I will point out a few things. Uh, Penn State 
uh, has one of the largest and the, one of the oldest agricultural uh, schools. Our College of Ag Sciences uh, is, is actually our original academic unit. Um, it, Penn State was founded back in 1855 as the Farmers High School. Uh, our mission was to educate the farmers of Pennsylvania. And as the land-grant university, we created our, uh, our campus system in order to be able to take that education out to the people of Pennsylvania. Um, what's important to note is if you have an interest in ag, and, and, and folks, we're not talking about farming anymore. Yes, that's still a part of it, but there are so many modern applications for agricultural sciences uh, that, that there's, there's limitless opportunities uh, there in a very modern way. But what's really important is that because it's the oldest academic college, it also has the largest endowment and they give out the largest scholarships. So keep that in mind. If you have an interest in ag sciences, make sure that you get that application in for, for uh, scholarships. Um, our College of Arts and Architecture, uh, that is one of the only areas where students must begin and finish their majors at the University Park campus. Um, those programs are all very competitive in and of themselves, so don't think of it as, oh, that's the easy way to get the guarantee to get into University Park uh, because it's anything but easy. Um, and when it comes to our business program, the Smeal College of Business Administration uh, is one of the top business schools, both public or private, in the nation. And uh, Smeal's outcomes, uh, the, the job placements, are just phenomenal. Um, engineering is a very popular major at Penn State. We have about two dozen different areas of engineering. And literally all of our programs are top 10 programs. Um, nursing, something very important. If you have an interest in nursing, we only offer nursing at eight different campuses and nursing is something that wherever you begin, you must finish. So while you can start at University Park, that is our most competitive campus for nursing, um, if you do end up at a campus, uh, get starting at a campus other than University Park, you need to know you must stay there for all four years. You, that is one major that does not apply to two plus two. Um, science, science is obviously a big uh, uh, part of Penn State. We have so many different majors in science, uh, earth and mineral sciences, information sciences and technology. One of the uh, areas of science that is very, very popular at Penn State is anything that's gonna lead to medical school, whether it's pre-med, biology, biomedical engineering, and, and I think the really important takeaway when it comes to pre-med is that um, students that want to go to medical school, the, the national average for placement into medical school at most colleges is on average about 59%. Uh, Penn State is consistently placing uh, at around 82 to 84% of those students that want medical school into a medical school. Uh, not necessarily Penn State's own medical school uh, because students can go uh, on any number of tracks, but we do an excellent job of preparing students for that. And then the final academic unit that I'd like to highlight is the Division of Undergraduate Studies. That is the academic home for the undecided student. Um, we have more students that come into Penn State in undecided, in the US as we call it, than in any individual major. Parents, don't worry. If your student is in DUS, they cannot graduate with a degree in undecided. We promise you that. Uh, they will work with, okay, so there, I did hear laughter, so they are, pay, they are paying attention, they're not sleeping. Uh, we, we can't really tell from up here, but. <laughs> in, in DUS, they're gonna work with an academic advisor uh, to explore, and they will ultimately be required to select a major before they head into the junior year. Um, moving on. Uh, Academic research, undergraduate research is a big part of Penn State, and that's true at all of our campuses, uh, whether it's the, the Lunar Lion Project where a group of uh, students across various different uh, academic disciplines is working to put, I believe it's a rover on, uh, onto the moon, uh, or something as simple as um, uh, working with faculty members on their individual research projects. There are so many opportunities for undergraduates to get their uh, their hands sort of dirty when it comes to research. Uh, we are a tier one research university. So our faculty across all campuses are heavily involved in research and there is uh, great opportunities for students uh, to get involved in those research opportunities. I also will point out that study abroad is a big thing at Penn State. We have about 2,400 students each year that participate in study abroad. We have about um, 300 programs uh, across uh, 
we actually have placed students across all seven continents, including Antarctica. We had a student that was uh, doing research, I guess, with uh, uh, penguins. Um, and, and so there are so many opportunities for you to leave uh, Penn State for a semester or so in order to uh, participate and study abroad and get that experience as well. Um, involvement outside of the classroom is a big part. Uh, of course, sports are big at, at University Park, uh, NCAA Division uh, 1A athletics. Uh, but we also have uh, either NCAA Division 3 or uh, Division 3 equivalent uh, conference programs at all of our Penn State campuses. So students that have an interest in sports can get involved at all campus locations. Um, clubs are a big part of the Penn State experience. There are about 1,200 different clubs and organizations. Uh, some of them are co-curricular, they're connected to academics. Um, we have fun, silly clubs that we had a group of students get together and form a club for those students named Bob. Anybody named Bob? You can join the club. Um, but there were people that weren't named Bob that didn't like that club, so they formed a club for people not named Bob. Now my favorite club, the one that I'm trying to get them to let me be the advisor for is the chicken wing eating club. Uh, you probably understand why. Um, so uh, one, of our, uh, one of our most life altering uh, extracurricular experiences is pictured up here and that's Penn State Stance Marathon. That will actually be coming up in just a few weeks. It is a 46 hour uh, dance marathon in which students from all across Penn State, all campuses, all different clubs, fraternities, sororities, et cetera, uh, get involved and raise money for the Four Diamonds Fund uh, for, the, for the fight against pediatric cancer. Last year, our students raised more than $10 million. It is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world, and to date, those students have raised more than $170 million. Um, if you go and participate, even if you go for just a couple hours to see and to watch, um, truly you will walk away a changed person. Um, the last thing that I'd like to uh, mention are some of the outcomes. And um, Penn State has one of the top ranked career services programs. Uh, and, and in fact, we have the largest collegiate career fair uh, in the country. We bring in tons of employers to meet with uh, students for prospective jobs. Um, we, uh, we have the largest dues-paying alumni association. Our alumni association has more than 170,000 members, uh, and, and that, that network can be incredibly helpful uh, as you're out there trying to land your first job or that, that new uh, advancement opportunity, uh, because that, in that network, those Penn State alums love to do nothing more than hire other Penn Staters, and in fact, uh, one in every 117 Americans with a college degree is a Penn State alum. So that's my spiel. Um, I'm not really going to go into any more detail. If you have questions, I'll hang around afterwards. Thanks, Dan. Actually, I only have one slide, so I don't need the oh, clicker. We can pass it down. But I'll click it to you. Yeah, oh, okay. thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael May. I'm the director of first year admissions at Slippery Rock. I've been there for about seven and a half years. And I want to say thank you to the NA family for including us in this wonderful evening. Uh, truth be told, uh, you know, I'm really happy to be here, but I'm really happy to be anywhere. Um, I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old at home, <laughs> so anytime I can be in front of people who are quiet, paying attention, and sitting in their seats, I jump at the chance to do that. So while I'm at it, thank you for not hitting each other. <laughs> um, just to kind of put Slippery Rock on the map, I'm sure you folks know where we're located, about 35 miles uh, up the road, and don't believe what Dr. Phil says, we are an actual college. Um, but I want to give you some um, numbers that will help kind of shape who we are for you. This past fall, our official enrollment was 8,806 students. That actually makes us the third largest out of the 14 PASHI institutions. We jumped over Bloomsburg this year, and so I like to say, IUP, you're on the clock, because we're coming for you. We have about 7,500 undergraduates, and that makes us sort of a mid-sized university. Again, about 35 miles up the road in a very rural environment. Um, small, safe, quiet. There are about 10,000 people when you add up the students, staff, and faculty at The Rock, and then another 3,000 residents who live in the borough of uh, Slippery Rock. In terms of admissions, we receive about 6,000 freshman applications each year, uh, shooting for a class of about 1,550. 
Um, we have something called automatic admission. So if your student has a 3.0 GPA, a 1030 on the SAT or a 20 on the ACT, they're automatically admitted and can choose any major that they want with the exception of dance, music, and theater because those uh, departments require auditions. Um, our average profile this past fall for our incoming freshmen was a 3.47 GPA and a 1088 SAT, just to kind of give you a sense of who's walking around our campus. And we're very proud that uh, about 80% of our students graduated in the top half of their class. But let's talk a little bit about academics. We do offer more than 150 academic programs that are housed in four colleges. I am going to read them off so everyone's aware. <laughs> the College of Education, the College of Business, the College of Health, Engineering, and Science, and the College of Liberal Arts. Um, exercise science is our most popular undergraduate major now, no longer uh, one of the education programs, although there still is quite a bit of interest in the College of Ed. Um, like some of my colleagues mentioned, about 20% of our students come in as undecided. We call it exploratory at Slippery Rock. And we also offer some cutting edge majors such as safety management, music therapy, and then also some, some more well-known traditional majors like English, physics, and Spanish. Uh, we're very excited about some of the new programs that we have in engineering, homeland and corporate security, physician assistant studies, occupational therapy, and healthcare administration and management. Um, this past fall, so fall 2019, we welcomed four new undergraduate programs at The Rock, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, cybersecurity, and musical performance theater. We like to say that the Glee generation is going to college. We're the only state system school where dance is a major. And if you come up and visit us, I'd say wait until June. Not only will the weather be a little bit nicer, but we're going to be opening up our new performing arts center that will house that musical performance theater program. We'd, we, we would really like to show that off uh, to you when it opens this summer. We also have some transitional programming called our first seminar which is a one credit class that all first year students have to take and it introduces them to note taking skills, time management skills and making sure that they're as successful as they can be as a new student and we believe that initiatives like this contribute to our 84% retention rate from first year to second year which is about 12% higher than uh, schools uh, our size. So we're really proud of that. I also want to mention um, that we have some affiliate programs actually with some of the, the my colleagues here. Um, if you're interested in law, we have partnerships with Duquesne and Widener, uh, Osteopathic Medicine, LECOM, which I'm sure you're, you're uh, aware of, Dental School also partners with LECOM and uh, West Virginia, and then Engineering, uh, we have partnerships with Pitt, Penn State, and Youngstown State. Um, I do want to mention a couple of bragging points. We do have 26 national accreditations for different academic programs. Uh, we're a six-time uh, College of Distinction award winner, um, and that recognizes SRU's commitment to engage students, great teaching, a vibrant community, and successful outcomes. Um, we give out uh, nearly $6 million in uh, academic scholarships each year, and we're very proud of the three-quarters of a million dollars that we award to our in-state students based on need to try to make a Slippery Rock education affordable for as many schools or as many students as possible. And last but not least, I do have a call out there on my slide that we have the number one four-year graduation rate in the state system um, and the number two uh, freshman to sophomore retention rate. So again, very proud of that. One other thing I want to mention, again, if you come up to visit, uh, you're going to see our $38 million uh, Smith Student Center which not only is a LEED Silver certified building, but it's designed to enhance the student experience uh, and their learning environment. There you're gonna find study space, uh, meeting rooms for different organizations, a movie theater, the campus bookstore, a food court, uh, and a Starbucks. So you'll definitely wanna hit up the uh, Smith Student Center when you're there. We'd love for you to come up and visit campus. Our next open house is actually on April 25th, but if you'd like to visit before then, we have a couple Saturday visits uh, this month in February, and you can always come up at any point in time during the week. We'd love to have you come and visit The Rock. So thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to go into the portion of our evening where each of our college representatives is gonna talk for a few minutes about a specific topic that we assigned to them. So if you would just pass the clicker down um, to Miguel, and he is going to start um, with 
something that we're just calling college jargon. So we asked Miguel if he would talk about all those fancy words in college admissions that no one knows what they mean. Early decision, early action, demonstrated interest. So now you're just going to learn a little bit about what we say is admissions 101. All right. So um, honestly, this is a really important topic, as, as uh, I know many of you are at different phases in terms of your college search process. But uh, as you go through, you visit colleges, you're going to be hearing a lot of jargon. So definitely good to familiarize yourself with what exactly it is that you'll be, you'll be hearing out there. Uh, the one takeaway from all of this, if you think about any of these things, it's important to recognize what the distinctions are between the different universities and their admission processes. Uh, you'll find that some universities have um, variances based off their historical precedents or whatever it may be. So uh, it's just important to keep in mind, any school that you're applying to, don't assume it's the exact same process somewhere else. Lots of differences to go through. Um, the first kind of big area here to think about uh, is going to be uh, involve the application deadlines. Uh, so as you think about applying to college, a lot of different schools are going to have some different options for you, uh, and you'll see a variety of them. The first sort of section within there, subsection within there to think about, are the early options. So if you want to apply to a college early, uh, be notified a little bit earlier on in the process, there are a few options for you and some differences that you'll hear as you go around the country. A first one uh, that I'll mention, uh, for example, Carnegie Mellon has this option. Uh, we are an early decision school. Uh, what this means is basically if you've determined that Carnegie Mellon is your number one option, you've done all your homework uh, on it and, it, that, and visited maybe, that includes financial aid uh, information, all that good stuff, you've got done your best to determine uh, and ultimately it's your number one choice and you're willing to sign a binding agreement stating that if you are admitted you will enroll, then you would go down the early decision process, which for us is November 1st. You apply a little bit uh, and, and you're notified a little bit later on through mid-December. Uh, other institutions may have other early options. We do not have early action, but a lot of institutions around the country do have early action, and this is a non-binding process where you're able to apply to a lot of these schools earlier on uh, and be notified earlier without that binding agreement. So again, important to kind of figure out and, and go through that distinction for schools that may be restricted early action. That may be a school that only allows you to apply uh, to one school under that early action policy. Uh, but again, important to kind of recognize what the school is, um, what the school's early process is and why they have an option there. Some things to keep in mind though, the early process isn't meant to be for everyone. It's definitely something that I'm sure as you go through the process, you'll start hearing a lot about. If you have great counselors here, you can obviously work with them to determine whether or not that's going to be a good fit based off the institutions that you're interested in. It, doesn't, it also doesn't necessarily guarantee an increase in admission. Uh, it may at some institutions, there may be higher probability of admission if you apply early rather than later. All those types of little details are worth uh, thinking about and really diving into the, the nuances uh, of. Um, other options, obviously, you have your regular decision process, which you'll hear RD uh, mentioned a lot. So as you hear these ED, early decision, EA, early action, uh, regular decision, RD, uh, uh, as you hear that jargon out there, just keep in mind exactly what uh, all of that includes. Another section uh, to keep in mind that you'll hear about as you visit different schools uh, is need blind versus need aware. So what this means is uh, as universities review applications, there will be some institutions that consider a student's ability to be able to pay towards that institution and pay towards their education at that institution when making a decision. Not necessarily, uh, each school might be a little bit different, but not necessarily the end all be all in terms of how they're gonna make their decision, but it could be a factor in the overall consideration. Important to look into uh, whether, where a school falls there. Uh, if you're a school like Carnegie Mellon, uh, then you are a need blind institution. We do not consider your ability to pay towards your education when making your decision. We're solely looking at your application. There may be other institutions that are need aware and really considering whether or not you can afford to, to pay. Uh, another area uh, to focus on is demonstrated interest. Uh, this is actually something Carnegie Mellon does not do, but a lot of institutions around the country uh, do this uh, for a variety of different reasons. So when you think about demonstrated interest, this is going to be any time that you connect 
uh, with a member of that admission office. Maybe you connected with during an alumni interview. Maybe you visit campus. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that universities can track your demonstrated interests. And important to consider whether or not the universities you're interested in uh, are considering uh, your, your demonstration towards your application. So it could be a factor within the overall process. Actually something that we used to do within our process, but we no longer do. Uh, so again, important to kind of review and check where uh, these institutions fall. The last one I'll talk about uh, is institutional priorities. This is definitely a crucial piece of the search process. When you think about the vastness of our country and the number of universities around the country, they all have different institutional priorities. You may see some similarities, uh, but there's gonna be really a lot of different things that are going on. You may have some schools and universities that may be focused on their local communities that may say we have to have a certain number of students from X municipality because they're in our backyard, whatever it may be. Uh, there's a variety of examples that fall into that place. Uh, you'll uh, notice things like athletics that may come into play. Uh, you'll notice a lot of variety of, of diversity uh, when it comes to racial diversity, when it comes to socioeconomic diversity. Uh, you know, if you're a place like Carnegie Mellon, we're always thinking about representation of women within our STEM disciplines. So all of those things are gonna fall into institutional priorities. I know a lot of folks jump and immediately think that the, the institutional priority must mean fundraising, uh, but again, there's all these other priorities that universities have to care carefully balance within, within higher education and are important to consider as you're comparing different uh, institutions out there. Uh, so very similarly to what Miguel said about uh, every college treating uh, their jargon a little bit differently, every college is gonna treat holistic admissions a little bit differently and a lot of different colleges, a lot of universities, I'm, as I'm sure you're all keenly aware, employ a holistic review process. So I don't necessarily wanna bore you with all of it. It's pretty self-explanatory in terms of looking at the whole thing holistically. Uh, but I wanted to go over sort of what goes into that holistic review and then what that actually looks like, how those different aspects are actually reviewed holistically. So in terms of the sort of basics of what you're submitting, almost every school is gonna ask for pretty similar things. You're either gonna submit a common app, you're gonna submit the coalition app, maybe you'll uh, submit an internal application to some schools. Um, typically these are online, maybe you'll have to mail it in. Um, that gives us basic information. It's a pretty good outline. I think of it sort of like standardized testing where some students are really good at it, some students aren't as good as it to no you know, detriment to the student. Um, it's a very formulaic application. Uh, it's not for everyone. That's why you're able to typically at most universities submit supplemental information. Sometimes that is required through supplemental essays. Sometimes it's not. Uh, typically more requirements come through in terms of recommendations, whether that's through your counseling staff, whether that's through your teachers. Really think about who you're asking for those recommendations because again, thinking holistically, what is that actually telling us? The essay, the activity sheet show us how you see yourself. The recommendations show us how adults see you, how your teachers see you, how a professor on our campus might see you down the road. A counselor uh, describing you might echo what an academic advisor down the road might see you as, might be able to uh, you know, form that relationship with you through. Uh, typically, obviously, a transcript is required uh, for most universities, if not all. Uh, yes, this can be holistic as well. It tends to be pretty objective in terms of numbers, in terms of lists of classes. Some ways that we look at it holistically are through the school report that your school will send us, that your counseling office sends us, uh, that allows us to look a little bit more detailed in terms of how many honors classes are offered, what kinds of AP classes are offered, um, what a, an above and beyond transcript at North Allegheny looks like versus an above and beyond transcript at Pine Richland down the street. Um, it really allows us to look a lot more contextually at our applications, at our students, and give you the benefit of the doubt because we are always looking for the positives in an application. We're never looking for demerits. We're never looking to mark a student down or looking for reasons to deny a student. We are looking for reasons to pull up an application. Um, in terms of the extras that you might submit, sometimes those are those supplemental essays that might be required through different universities. 
Uh, sometimes that is as simple as sitting down and looking at your Common App, looking at how you'll come across on paper when we're reading your application and saying, hey, this, this doesn't look right. I wasn't able to fully explain this. I wasn't able to fully get this across. I want to submit an additional resume or I want to, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the activity sheet, I think that captured me perfectly, but I don't know that they know exactly how deeply I go into drama, so I want to submit a video or I want to submit a recording that I've done or um, I want to send an email to my counselor to let them know how much I love the school because my aunt went there and et cetera, et cetera. It's really anything that you want to do to round out your application. It's not necessarily adding new information. It's much more so about contextualizing what we're already seeing, rounding out what we're already seeing, um, and really putting forward that stronger application. In terms of how we are evaluating all of this, in terms of how it gets evaluated holistically, first and foremost, and again, this differs college to college, university to university, uh, at a lot of universities, and speaking from Northeastern's perspective, typically there are a lot of eyes on each application, uh, whether it is the territory manager, whether it is the, through the committee process, um, m a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different biases are looking at each application, uh, are able to you know, take each different aspect of the application and assign you know, different priorities, everything like that to them. Um, we are looking at all aspects of the application, uh, whether a school has only a few requirements or whether a school has a whole lot of requirements. Um, each different aspect of your application, whether it is those more objective uh, criteria on your transcript, your grades, the rigor that you're taking on, uh, standardized testing, whether it is involvement in extracurricular activities, um, thinking about breadth of uh, involvement versus depth of involvement. Uh, there are all sorts of different aspects of your application no one thing is going to uh, rule out all the rest. Um, everything acts in concert. Uh, a student who is concerned about their GPA, maybe they're really involved. Um, a student who is concerned about their testing, maybe they are um, deeply interested. There are all sorts of pushes and pulls within an application for each student. Um, within the holistic review process, typically nothing is a make or break, um, which makes things sometimes frustrating for students. Um, but really, I think, speaks to the amount of time that gets spent on each application uh, and the amount of personalization uh, and the amount of power that students have over uh, what their application actually winds up looking like. Okay, uh, I get to talk to you about uh, my favorite topic and sometimes least favorite topic uh, related to admission, and that is the, the college admission essay. Um, I say it's my favorite because I will tell you that uh, when I look at a student's application and I see test scores, I see grade, uh, grade point average, I would tell you students are not terribly interesting at that point. You're rather two-dimensional. Uh, you know, we see these numbers, uh, but what is more fun is to really understand, you know, why you uh, act in your, your school's music why you love basketball or whatever else it may be and I think the opportunity for students to do that uh, to really stand out in that third dimension is to include that in their college admission essay and so um, uh, in this talk I, I want to kind of uh, talk about some some pit pitfalls maybe some things that you may want to avoid and uh, and certainly I can answer questions uh, uh, once we get to the Q&A a part uh, but you know the first piece of advice I would give you is uh, that uh, we're not writing movies uh, where, where we're running admission essays at this point. And uh, with uh, the Oscars just being a few days away, I, I'm pretty proud. I, I've seen all the Best Picture nominations, and I feel like it's my, my obligation to tell people when I see a good movie that you should go see it too. And my co coworkers will tell you I am terrible at summarizing a plot for a movie, and I tell them all about these things. And I think in a very similar way, if you're trying to do uh, that same thing, uh, do things that happen in movies and put that down on paper, I don't think that makes for a good admission essay. 
And I often sometimes, if I'm critical about what a student is doing, sometimes they are unnecessarily descriptive. They will spend paragraphs describing how blue the water was on their, their family vacation when that actually has nothing to do with uh, the question that's being asked uh, in the essay. So that, that's one aspect I would encourage students uh, to, to really clear out is that you don't have to spend time you know, with big adjectives and uh, talking about how blue something is or whatever it may be. Uh, the other thing I would point out, uh, you know, similar to movies, sometimes students will include huge sections of dialogue as if they are writing a movie script. And I think that is a very poor use of your space. Uh, in many cases, you have 250 to, uh, to 500 words uh, to write your admission essay. And if you include this very long conversation, you can include, you can wipe out 25% of your space and really not make a very solid point. And I would tell you that you do not have the benefit of lights and cameras camera and uh, makeup and special effects and the conversation that you remember in your head is just not as entertaining as you might remember it when you're conveying it on, on paper. So I would say, you know, limit uh, these uh, conversations uh, in, in your essays. Uh, as far as um, how you format your essays, um, my colleagues and I often debate this. Uh, you know, the idea of the five paragraph essay with a thesis and everything like that. I think a lot of it, people in the admission world would say that you certainly don't have to do that. But I'm also of the mindset that you don't throw out the basics uh, when you're trying to do something. And if I had to also be critical about what students sometimes do in their essays is that they sometimes are writing aimlessly. They will go off on long tangents uh, that uh, do not uh, really address the question that's being, being answered. And I think if you maybe start off with the five paragraph format that will limit you from droning off into to random tangents and everything like that. So perhaps start off that way. If you don't want to be uh, that formal, you can uh, evolve into something uh, that is not the five paragraph essay. Uh, the other thing that we often talk about, of course, is proofreading. And I think sometimes when I do describe the essay as not my favorite part of the admission process, it's because the student has gone into the essay rather unprepared. And I will see essays with lots of spelling errors. The student does not uh, is not exercising their use of gr grammatical rules or anything like that, and I think you can certainly avoid that by just taking the time to uh, you know uh, include some time to proofread your essay, whether that's with you and your parents, a close friend, your your English teachers, and so on and so forth. And I think an important idea when it comes to the proofreading is that you do want to limit how many people you proofread your your essay. If you have 15, 20 people, uh, you know, make cuts on your essay by the time it's all said and done, is that still your piece of work? Is your voice still present? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why you want to be rather limited in how many people you have proofread your essay. But I think a good way to make sure that it's still your voice is to make sure that you're the last person who reads your essay is a close friend of yours. And if you can ask them this question and say, you know, John, does this sound as though I am the person who wrote this essay? And if your friend can say, yeah, that totally sounds like you, I think you're definitely on the right track. So those are some ideas uh, that I would share with you when it comes to the essay. I would tell you, again, it is my way to get further insight into this student. Um, people have asked me, you know, what are some of your, your favorite essays that you've seen in the past? Um, I would tell you, you know, I would point to two that really stick out in my mind. Uh, there was a young lady from uh, the state of Nebraska who really talked about her, her uh, arch enemy uh, all through grade school and high school. And I think it was pretty interesting because uh, my friends and I, as we looked at the initial parts of this essay, thought it would be a rather negative essay that she was just going to compare, uh, actually uh, uh, complain about this student uh, for, for five paragraphs. And that's actually not what she did. Uh, uh, you know, she does kind of uh, paint this villain at the very beginning, but she does kind of use this sense of irony and spins us on our head by telling us how much she actually received respects the student and how she would not be able to achieve the things that she had, had done if she was not pushed along by competing with the, this young man uh, all through high, uh, high school. And I thought that was actually a pretty great way to talk about your motivations and everything like that. Uh, a few years ago at Villanova, we asked an essay question asking students to look back at uh, books or TV shows or movies that they really liked when they were younger. And as they've grown older, how has that changed? Uh, how, uh, how how has that changed? And there was a student who uh, uh, wrote about the, the cartoon Pokemon, and I thought that was a, a pretty bold thing to do. And they referenced a very specific episode, uh, which was Meowth Go West. And if you know anything about Pokemon, uh, Meowth is the Pokemon that can actually talk like a human being. And in that episode, you learn 
how Meow uh, figured all of that out. And I think uh, the funny thing that the student was able to do was really relate that to how people communicate in general and how that's always an evolving process. So, you know, taking something, uh, you know, that you really liked when you were six or seven and, you know, showing how it is impactful and still relevant to you at age 18, 19, I think that's something that's pretty impressive. So uh, the essay, again, I think it's something uh, that is a fun aspect of the college admission process. I hope that you are not stressed out about writing an essay, I think what you can do is make it a fun exercise. Look at a lot of the schools that you're considering, what questions that they're asking, and even dive into some other schools too. Uh, the University of Chicago is very famous for asking very off-the-wall questions, and I think if you look at some of those questions, it can be a really fun exercise in, in, in creativity. So uh, again, uh, we can uh, answer questions about this uh, once we get to that part. Are there any overused essay topics that you would like students to avoid? Um, sure, you know, uh, I, so I, I never want to say avoid these topics at all costs, but every now and then a student will tell me, you know, I would love to write something that you have never seen before, and I would tell you this is a really amazing goal to have, especially when I'm reading your application potentially at 10.30 in the evening. Uh, so that being said, I would tell you I have seen thousands of essays where students talk about uh, athletics, whether that's really big games that they've been in and winning them or being injured and getting past that. Um, I've seen students talk about religious uh, uh, retreats that they've been on. Uh, students have done that. And I'm not telling you that you uh, shouldn't write about these things. I am fairly confident that you can get into many schools by touching on that topic. But again, if your goal is to stand out among a pool of several thousand, uh, you can avoid those topics and jump into other areas and show off a bit more creativity. And parents, every 11th grade student will actually work on their Common App essay in their 11th grade English class during the fourth nine weeks, so just so everyone knows. All right, so I get to talk about the SSSRAR or the SSAR. So if you don't know what that is, that is the self-reported academic record or student self-reported academic record, pretty much the same thing. Pretty much what that means is you are going to type your high school transcript onto a website, and this is what university is used to figure out what your transcript is um, and also recalculate your GPA. So how you do it is you will go onto the university's website. So University of Florida um, uses the SRAR. Um, this lovely gentleman also uses Didn't the SR. Didn't Pen. Say both. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so they also use it. So pretty much what students will do is you will want to make sure to get a copy of your transcript from your college counselor or guidance counselor so you are able to do this at home or in the classroom if you'd prefer. Ninth and ninth, 10th and 11th grade, you will type in your courses. You really want to make sure those courses on your transcript also match where you're going to write online because it makes it a lot harder for this phase to figure out what this class is when we're looking at it once you graduate, um, I was about to say college, um, high school. When you're doing it, 12th grade, we will ask what classes you're taking, but you're just going to say it's still in progress because you're not going to have a grade for it. We just want to see what type of classes that you're taking so then we can see that you're still pushing yourself and still taking those rigorous courses without taking eight periods of study hall, which I don't think is possible, but you never really know. Um, also, you're also you're going to include dual enrollment courses, so if you are taking dual enrollment courses, you want to do that. Um, universities use this for two reasons. So at University of Florida, we use the SRAR because we like to recalculate GPAs. That's because your school is different than Florida, than California. So by recalculating the GPAs, it puts everyone on the same playing field. But also some u universities use it so then that way we don't have to worry about a transcript being lost in the mail or waiting on someone for you to do to send the transcript so by doing it online it puts it all on you and just making sure that you are able to reach those deadlines and don't have to worry about a big snowstorm or like a hurricane and mail getting lost and things like that the biggest tip that I can give uh, for students is just making sure that the, your transcript also matches what is on the SRAR or the SSAR. 
also, I'm saying SSAR or the SRAR because the SSAR is just for you, Florida's public universities in Florida. I really want to put this out here because a lot of students get them mixed up and some universities have hard deadlines like us and if you say that you did one and not the other, we can't help you out. So you really want to make sure that when you're checking the university that you're applying to, making sure that you're filling out the right application. Also, when you are applying within the common application, there is, um, in the beginning, you are able to also kind of do the same thing. Also look to see if that university or college accepts it within the common application. I know we don't, and I know Penn State also doesn't either. So just kind of keep that aware and making sure you're really double checking the website and things like that. But also if you really don't know, please contact your admission counselor because they will help you and just answer that question for you. When it comes to grades and rigor, this isn't an easy answer um, <coughs> for this question. We as admission reps, we like to see the mixture of advanced and honors courses along with high grade point averages, but it's all about finding the perfect balance for you but also do realize that to be competitive for some schools, you do have to take those AP, IB, dual enrollment courses or honors classes. We like to see that you're challenging yourself and taking that rigorous course load, but we also want you to be successful and do well in those classes. So just know when we are making decisions, it's not based on a certain set of requirements, like you need to have five AP or five dual enrollment classes, but we're just looking at the overall applicant pool. So don't feel like you have to take all these AP if you can't handle um, the rigor or the coursework, but also staying active on top of that. That's all I got. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the campus visit and how you can engage best with uh, the the, the colleges or universities that you're visiting. Um, and I gotta tell you, I really believe in the campus visit. I'm sure all of my colleagues do. It's, you know, to me, it's a little like uh, shopping for a pair of shoes. You know, they look really great on the shelf, but when you put them on, they're either comfortable or they're not comfortable. It doesn't matter how they look on the shelf, right? So when you're surfing the web and you're checking out all these uh, collegiate websites and you're looking at the brochures that we'll hand out at the, the NACAC uh, college fair or the, any of the other events that we're at, you can rest assured that we have the best photos of the prettiest people and the greenest grass and the bluest skies and our uh, most attractive buildings and all of that. Um, it, it's not until you actually go and visit the campus that you get that sort of unvarnished look and so to me, it's the most critical component. Um, and so when you're, when you're planning to do a campus visit, you have some choices to make. And it starts with, do you attend a big event or do you try to make an appointment for a one-on-one -on -one visit? I'll be honest with you, at big schools, for instance, University Park, it's really hard to do a one-on-one -on -one visit. Um, even their, their uh, weekly visits are rather large. And their big events, uh, the Spend a Summer Day programs, attract thousands of students uh, on any one given day in the summer. Uh, but you do get a different experience, um, and it really depends on what it is that you're interested in. Um, at a big event, faculty are going to be available, the right students are going to be available, it, it, the, the tours, the labs are all going to be open. You're really going to get to see and experience as much as that college or university can craft for you on that visit. You may not get all of that type of an exposure on a one-on-one -on -one visit, but you know, you, you come onto a campus on any given Tuesday and um, you're really just going to see how things are on, on that campus uh, on a, on a average normal basis and so it really depends uh, on what you're trying to, to look for. When you go to a visit um, there are things that you want to learn that, that, that you want to take away and, and much of that comes back to the success of its students. Uh, for instance first year retention rates. Um, there is probably no more critical piece of data than first year retention. Uh, we deal with that all the time. We are constantly looking at how many of our students are coming back to us for the second year. On average, 
it's about 77%. It's a little higher for private institutions. It's about 80% uh, on average uh, for private institutions and 72% for public universities. Uh, but if you stop and think about it, one out of four students isn't going to be back for their second year. You want to, to make sure that you're learning as much as you can to make sure that the school that you choose is the right fit so that you're not that one out of four that has to go and find a different school in the second year. Um, and obviously it's not just about retention to the second, uh, second year, it's also about graduation. Now colleges report four, five, and six year graduation rates. I will only even talk about six year graduation rates, I'm sorry. Um, our programs are not designed to last six years, and, and I do believe that uh, a large percentage of our students are graduating in four, four and a half years. But the reality is that college is a journey, it's not a race, and for many students, they're changing majors, they're, they're finding a fit, they're running into problems early on, and they have to, it takes time to overcome that. That's why colleges report six-year graduation rates. And the national average for six-year graduation rates, 63%. Uh, again, it's a uh, little higher at private institutions. It's about 66. It's 60% 60 at public institutions. And the national average for private, not-for-profit institutions, um, not any of us that are represented up here, uh, I'm sorry, private for-profit institutions, not any of us uh, represented up here, that's 21%. So keep that in mind. The goal is not to get admitted to college. The goal is to earn the degree, all right? Um, and along the way, you want to make sure that you're learning about academic advising. At some schools, it's faculty who do the academic advising. At other schools, they have professional advisors and advising centers. Well, what's the difference? Well, I'll tell you that uh, the professional advisors that are working in advising centers, they tend to be more accessible. It's easier to get to them, um, but you may get better depth of advising, more career outcomes advising when you are uh, getting your advising from a faculty member. And I would tell you that even if your school offers the professional advisors, find that faculty, me uh, faculty member to become your mentor or your unofficial advisor to help you in those other areas. Um, learn about the, uh, the student portals and how much self-service uh, is available. At a large institution like Penn State, we do a lot of uh, self-service enrollment. It's, it's uh, something called uh, Lion Path that allows uh, our students to uh, get in and schedule their classes and manage their financial aid. And it, and it puts a lot of responsibility on the student, uh, which is a good thing, but it's also a challenging thing, especially to those freshmen that aren't used to that. Um, and, and finally, especially if you're undecided, but not exclusively, what kind of resources are available for those undecided students or those students that may think they know what they want to do and end up needing to change their major? And, and oftentimes there is a gap of time between knowing what you don't want to do and figuring out what it is that you want to do and how, what kind of help is available to help you navigate through that. And finally, career services is also important. Um, what kind of help is, is available for finding jobs and internships? If colleges are promising you outcomes, promising you jobs, I, I'm skeptical. I, we provide resources. We can provide access uh, through things like college uh, uh, career fairs uh, and, and bringing in college recruiters. But we don't typically make promises, and so that, that's a, a red flag in my book. Um, those career fairs can be very valuable, um, so it gives you, even if it's nothing more than giving you that experience on how to network and talk to prospective employers, it's incredibly valuable, and hopefully there are lots of online planning, uh, career planning resources that are available to you, not just as a student, but after you graduate as well. Um, campus life is something that you're going to want to inquire about. Of course, there's activities like clubs, co-curricular clubs, leadership opportunities. Uh, if you are an athlete, though, and, and athletics has been important to you, you need to find what kind of sports opportunities, whether it's, whether it's uh, intercollegiate, whether it's club or intramural or rec sports, um, various different divisions. Not everyone can be a Division I athlete, uh, but... 
everyone that has a passion for sports can find that outlet. And quite frankly, from my experience, and I've been doing this job for about two decades now, um, it, that student that walks away from their sport when they're coming into college um, is going to have a much more difficult time finding their way. They've, they've lost something that they've been very passionate about. Um, living, living options, all right? Um, it's, it's great if you can commute and you can save a lot of money, but most students are finding that they're going to colleges that require them to live somewhere. My personal rule of thumb is, um, even if it's not required for you to live on campus your first year, live on campus your first year. If you want to be successful, if you want to be back in your second year, you want to earn your degree from that institution, live on campus that first year. Students that live off campus as freshmen do not perform as well academically. They're just not used to that transition. Um, but don't be overly wowed by the fancy apartments and suites and all of that. That's great for those students that are in their second, third, fourth year. Uh, but you know what? If you want to get in and make friends and really engage with the campus community, um, there's nothing like a traditional dorm. It may not be um, sexy, uh, but, but, but trust me, it is the best way to get to meet folks and to be integrated into your campus life. Um, and the, the best people to tell you what life is like on the weekends, okay, big colleges tend to have a lot of life on the weekends, smaller colleges, it, it really depends. Um, talk to students. Um, if you're at a small regional school, maybe lots of folks go home on the weekends, it gets really quiet. You know what? That's a great selling point for studying. Uh, so talk to students and find out what life is like on the weekends. And, and, and that's my last point is talk to students and talk to faculty if you can when you visit the campus because you're going to get an unvarnished, direct uh, perspective on what life is like. Um, those tour guides, um, they, they really are valuable for asking those questions. But if you bump into somebody in, in the uh, dining hall or in the hallway, you know what, talk to them as well. Uh, they have great, uh, a great wealth of information that can help you to determine if that college you're visiting is the right fit. And that's all that I have. Thank you. Well, um, my topic is the fit, right? The, the, the fit for the right college. And Dan, it was really kind of a perfect segue because the campus visit is such an important part of determining whether or not a school is the right fit for you. Now, one of the perils of going last is that everyone steals your thunder, right? So Dan just mimicked a lot of what I was gonna say, but what I wanna try to do is give some advice to the students and the families here tonight at the beginning, at the end, and touch a little bit on these different aspects. I think I took a, 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 a poll on the street of what attributes people think they should consider when trying to find the right fit in a college. And this is what I came up with. And um, the ones with an asterisk we'll talk about uh, a little bit separately because I think they can be valuable, but you can also um, place too much faith in those attributes. But in terms of the advice that I want to give students is, um, you know, you've probably heard this before, right? But the college search process, it's a match to be made, not a prize to be won. And I know that's sometimes difficult to keep the front of your brain as you go through the process. And you could say, Mike, easy for you to say. You've already gone through the process and you're the keeper of the gate. But it really is important that it is about fit. And so I want to speak directly to the students and let them know, encourage them to trust your gut. When you go on that visit, you're going to get a sense pretty quickly as to whether or not this is a school you want to keep on your list and keep learning about it or if this just isn't the most comfortable place for you and you won't thrive there. So I really want to encourage you to trust your gut. Um, again, this dovetails into what you were saying, Dan, but if you come up to Slippery Rock and hear me speak at the open houses, um, I give some advice to students um, that was given to me by my high school counselor when I was sitting in your shoes 26 years ago. It's hard to say. Uh, but he said, Mike, there's no better resource than someone who is where you want to be and was where you are. And we have NA students on all of our campuses, and there's no better resource than talking to them about what the transition was like from here to our campuses, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? But you really want to know the skinny 
uh, of that experience. And the last thing I want to say before we touch on some of these topics to the students is that you will be as successful as you want to be. I thought, Miguel, you led off really nicely talking about the diversity among the higher ed options in America. And the nice thing about that is that there is a right fit for everybody. And there's more than one right school for everybody. So while it may not always feel like that when you're going through the process, know that if you jump in head first and you give it your all, you'll get a lot out of it, the experience, you'll become a better person, and you'll be just fine. Don't target one school and think that that's the only school that you could go to. So the first topic is affordability. And I know you've heard a lot about rising college costs and uh, loan debt and all of those sorts of things. So obviously affordability is really important. I want to encourage you not to limit your application options by the sticker price, right? You should find those schools that you're interested in that are good fits for you and apply, and then worry about the financial aid package when you get it. And then you can find out what the real out-of-pocket cost is and make that value judgment uh, as a family. But I don't want anyone to look at a certain price and think, well, that's out of our ability to pay because oftentimes there's some nice financial aid packages that go behind that. So try not to limit that. But also a lot of the conversations we have now are about those out-of-pocket costs, how much are we willing to pay, especially if you're thinking of going on to graduate school, right? Because that's an additional cost. So families are starting to look at bundling programs and what do those costs uh, mean. And again, to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying, does, does anyone know what the most expensive part of college is? It's the fifth year. Don't pay for a fifth year. You should be on the four-year plan. Get in, get out, get on with your life. So keep that in mind. Obviously, you want to think about the size of the school. And we have, um, really, it runs the gamut, right, from smaller liberal arts schools, which have really wonderful resources, but they may be a little bit more limited, um, to larger Division I research one institutions that are much bigger, that offer everything under the sun. You know, if you went to a small school of 2,300 students, the, the Bob Club might be pretty small. <laughs> we have to be okay with that, right? Slippery Rock's a little bit in the middle. We don't offer nursing. We're not big enough to offer a nursing program. So those are sorts of the, thing, the sort of things that you want to flesh out a little bit. I put the asterisk near um, you know, alumni success, because I think that's the, kind of the, the shiny penny that people look at. And I want you to know that it can be important if you have personal relationships or the alumni community is one that reaches out to you. Uh, but I've had uh, uh, students from my alma mater reach out to me and ask for a personal favor. And I say, well, the first part of a personal favor is I have to know you as a person. Right, so how involved are the alumni? How willing are they? I mean, geez, the Penn State alumni are all over the place. I know they, they will lend a helping hand whenever they can, but that's not, that's not the situation everywhere. So I, I put it on the list because I think a lot of people target that, but I would actually say that it's, it's something a little bit less important than some of the other things uh, that, that we're, we're talking about. And I wanna reiterate that you can be successful no matter where you go to college. Um, the types of majors and the breadth of majors offered. Uh, that can be really important. Depending on the data that you look at, you see sometimes 50% to 75% of undergraduates change their major at least once. That's not always a bad thing. If you're undecided, you have to change your major at some point, right? We also hope that most colleges and universities offer uh, topics of study that you weren't exposed to in high school. How do you know you don't want to be studying sociology if you've never had sociology uh, at the high school level? It does allow you to discover new passions. And I just want to say from a personal standpoint, uh, those of you who know me know that I went to school uh, as a pre-med major. Uh, and then I took organic chemistry. Uh, and at the encouragement of my chemistry faculty, I walked over to the history department and became a history major and I traded problem sets for papers. So you can be a success still if you change your major and you can graduate uh, in four years. And this dovetails into you know, the schools, as Dan was saying, that have the higher retention rates. They're having great advising and they also are able to help students discover the best path to success for themselves. If one avenue 
doesn't work out for one reason or another, you could find a better avenue. And again, that's something that you want to be looking at when you look at schools. Location, uh, I just want to mention um, something that I found in my experience that oftentimes, to use your word, cities are sexy. People want to go to the big city, right? Nothing wrong with that. But what I would encourage you to do is take the temperature of um, the campus in terms of the activity and the engagement of the students. Uh, I went to a school that was an hour train ride uh, away from New York City. That's cool. I went to New York maybe once or twice a year because there was so much going on on campus that I wanted to be involved in that. Again, if you want to be in a big city or near a big city, that's totally fine but also look at what there is being offered uh, on the campus, and also realize that a lot of college graduates, right after they graduate, their first job, they migrate to a city. So you can go to a rural school, you can go to a suburban school, you can go to a city school, it, it doesn't really matter, but think about what is the best learning environment uh, for you. I wanted to mention a little bit about extracurricular organizations because so much of the learning and the development that goes on in college happens outside of the classroom. And so this is uh, whatever you're involved in, you can follow your passion, you can uh, discover new passions, but it's also a, a really wonderful way to get outside of your major uh, because you might be interacting with a lot of students who have similar academic interests and it's nice to be on the ultimate Frisbee team or work for the daily newspaper or whatever the case may be and mix and mingle with students who have different academic interests and talents. I also think that getting involved extracurricularly is a great way to learn the lessons of leadership, uh, of teamwork, and of harnessing the power of diversity, which are all characteristics that translate into very successful employees. Uh, so those are very valuable uh, skills. Uh, I put another asterisk next to prestige. Uh, and reputation. Again, those important. Uh, those are those can be important, uh, but I would put them lower down on the list. Um, full disclosure: uh, I graduated from Yale, um, and I won't be naive to say that that hasn't helped me at certain areas. But uh, no one's ever asked less of me because I went to Yale, uh, and I don't know the Bushes personally uh, or anyone else famous. So I don't even have a sticker on the back of my car. So while it's, it's something that I think a lot of students reach again for that shiny penny, what's much more important is how you develop as a, as a person and that fit um, so that you get the most out of those, those four years. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about residential life uh, because again, um, you'll be living and learning hopefully from people who are very different from you. Um, and uh, our career development director at Slippery Rock uh, always has a nice response when, when students are afraid about going the random route and getting matched up with a roommate that they don't know in college. He always says, guess what? In the workplace, you don't get to choose who you work with. Why should you get to choose who you live with, right? You gotta concentrate on what you have in common. And learn sometimes learning how to work with difficult people is the best skill that you can have. So think about the different opportunities that you have to live on campus. I completely agree with Dan uh, that there's a lot of data that says the students who live on campus, especially the first year, are the most engaged. They persist, they graduate, they're happy, they're successful, and there are a lot of resources in um, successful transformation of students and their learning on all of our campuses. And you have to be on campus to take advantage of those. So um, please see that as something that's important. There's a couple more things I want to mention in terms of financial aid. Um, sometimes financial aid can be a dirty word because we say financial aid and you hear free money, but we hear loans and scholarships. So you'll want to, when you get your financial aid packages, feel free to not only work with the schools, but also other people who understand the process in terms of, again, how do we make this happen? What are going to be the financial repercussions? Can we afford this? Can we make it happen? Um, and weigh your options and then make a, make a, a value judgment uh, as a family. Again, the average debt in the United States, depending on who you ask, uh, is between thirty and $36,000. Uh, for loan debt at the end of the four years for people who take out loans. That's a lot of money, but you know, it's a really high-end car, right? That's a great investment in yourself. I talk with people who have more than $100,000 uh, in loan debt after their four years as an undergraduate, and they're not a doctor, 
So that's a problem, right? We need to make smart choices and understand what we're getting ourselves into. And the last one, demographics. You know, obviously there are, there are um, women's colleges, there are religiously based colleges. So if there's a special population or community that you're really in tune with, those are always options. But I think a lot of students really look for, even if you're staying locally, how do I go to a school where there's, there's diversity and there are students who are different from me because I can learn about a different experience? And that's, families are wonderful, but for the most part, the experience is homogeneous. And so it's really, the college experience can be the first time that you realize that people grew up differently than you. And that can be a really wonderful life lesson. lesson. Uh, so, to put kind of a bow uh, on everything, I wanted to say that remember that you're not purchasing uh, a hoodie from the bookstore or a sticker for the back of your car. Uh, what we're hopefully purchasing is uh, an enjoyable and challenging environment that's going to prepare us for a successful career as well as empower us to contribute as a citizen in our community, however you define your community. And I wanted to leave you um, with a quote that I, whenever I can share it with people, I do because I love it. Uh, it's not really important who said it, but it's a British philosopher from two centuries ago. Um, and he said, the true toil for a, the true reward, excuse me, the true reward for a person's toil is not what they get from it, but who they become through it. And I think that's a wonderful way to say that this is a journey. You're going to be fine. You're going to be successful. It's not always going to be easy. You're going to have ups and downs. That's life. But you could become the person that you've always wanted to be by going through this path. And so I want to encourage you to enjoy the, the journey and also understand that the true value of your experiences are not always immediately evident. Uh, but they appear to be the most useful when you're in the right point in your life that they can reveal their value. So again, you're going to have ups and downs, but if you think of it as a journey, and hopefully you'll be a wonderful, uh, you'll broaden your horizons and really be, as we like to say at Slippery Rock, more of a, a polished rock at the end of four years than kind of a, a rough stone or a, or a slimy pebble even at the beginning of the journey. So <laughs> I'll end with that. Thank you for that wisdom. So we are now going to go to our question and answer portion. Thank you all for your questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. So I'm going to do my best to ask a lot of the questions that were repeated fairly often, um, some of the ones that were more global in nature. There were a lot of very individualized questions. I do encourage you all to get onto each of these colleges' websites if you have a specific question. There will be an email address for an admissions office. You're welcome to ask your more personalized questions there. You might even have a chance at the NACAC Fair this week, which we'll hit on at the end, um, to visit with the reps and talk about your more individualized questions. Um, so for the first one, um, some parents were asking, how can they get their students interested in choosing a college for those kids who might be a little bit hesitant? Any quick tips? Charge them rent. <laughs> it gets real very quickly if you do that. Now, you know, we're representing colleges. It's, it's a very legitimate question. I mean, college is not for everyone, and I don't think it should be marketed that way. And it doesn't always mean that after your senior year, college is the right choice. Some people take gap years. They work for a little while, those sorts of things. But it comes back to that, that campus visit, I think, and talking to people who are knee-deep in the experience. You know, I think the root of the question is, my son or daughter is not seeing the value in that experience. And so I think you want to have a very transparent and sincere conversation, again, with people who are knee-deep in the experience, and even professionals like us, to say, these are the doors that can be open to you through a college experience. I would also add, if your student is really not ready to go to college, do not force it. Um, those students that are there only because their parents have made them, um, and they, they could be very good high school students, and I've seen top high school students fail out their first year because they're just not interested in being there. Let them come to that epiphany through 
hard work and manual labor. Maybe it'll take a year, maybe it'll take two years or a little bit longer, uh, but they can actually do real damage to themselves if they go and don't perform well because they're just not motivated. How diverse are your campuses in terms of students with learning disabilities? Um, any advice for students with learning disabilities? Um, so I think that's something that every college is going to be a little bit different, but every college, especially the colleges and universities that are up here, are going to have a ton of resources for students. Uh, it can really be all sorts of different resources, whether it is as deep as one-on-one -on -one tutoring, uh, class by class, whether it is uh, sort of on the other end of the spectrum um, of uh, just a student who's uh, self-aware and knows that they might fall behind and make use of professor's office hours, things like that. That's also something that you can take advantage of on a campus visit. Maybe meet with professors, talk with students, ask them how they do in classes, um, you know, on, again, that lighter end of the spectrum, but then also look into uh, whether the campus has a disabil disability resource center, whether they have uh, dedicated writing centers, whether they have dedicated um, you know, math centers, whether there are uh, TAs who run recitation periods. Um, there are just a whole plethora of uh, different resources really depending on what the actual disability might be, what the actual um, needs or wants of the student might be. Um, but it's always something that's gonna be a little bit different, but every college, every university is gonna have some capacity to handle whatever uh, a student might throw at them. And I would just add, uh, I actually did a lot of my graduate research on college students with learning disabilities. And the thing that I learned that sh shocked me at the time is that many students with a learning disability, when they go to college, they do not want to disclose. They want to prove to themselves and to the world that they can be successful on their own without any additional support. And as altruistic as that is, that is probably not in their best interest, especially early on. Um, I also am an, uh, an instructor, I teach in communications, and in my classes, um, I have students every semester that have a learning disability, and they may find that in my class, they don't need a lot of additional support, but in that next class, maybe it's a math class or a science class, they need that note taker, they need that, that quiet place to take a test, they need the extra time. Um, remember, colleges and universities are required by law to provide reasonable accommodations uh, to help students to be successful. And they want all students to be successful. The IEP that you may have had in high school, that doesn't apply. Uh, that may be a starting point for discussion, but that that no longer uh, holds uh, any, um, any merit in the college system. Uh, so the accommodations may not be, in fact, what they had in high school, but those students who need some type of accommodation need to disclose. If they do not disclose, we cannot provide anything extra, and therefore many of them are not successful. A couple of CMU questions. CMU, do you accept subject tests taken between freshman and sophomore year? That's a great question. Um, so in terms of uh, subject tests and testing for us, uh, the way that we see tests is uh, we're trying to measure your preparedness right before you go off into college. So our strong preference when it comes to testing uh, is really for, for it to be uh, within two years of when you're applying to college. Uh, we have that strong preference and, and we have it mentioned on our website. So uh, again, when it comes to testing, uh, it's seen as a kind of prep right before college. So we, we wanna have those be um, right up to that date as close as possible. And Miguel, also for you, if you're rejected at your ED school, can they apply to a new school in regular decision? If you're rejected from uh, Carnegie Mellon under early decision, Correct. can they apply to a again different college? So if you are uh, rejected under early decision, we do give all those students the option, though all those students receive an email from us where we ask them if they have interest in another college, and if so, we move their application over to regular decision. So that is something that does take place uh, where you can move, but you have to select another program. You're, you only get one shot really at that uh, one college under early decision, and then under regular, you'd have to select from the other colleges uh, within the university. One more, Miguel. Sure. Can students transfer easily 
after their freshman year to a different college. Yeah, so this is one of the unique uh, qualities uh, of Carnegie Mellon. So like I mentioned earlier, one of, the, one of the most important things when you think about Carnegie Mellon is actually what college you are selecting uh, through your application. When you are admitted to the university, uh, you are enrolling within the specific college that you were admitted to. Uh, so it is important that you kind of know even through the enrollment phase whether or not that's the right college for you. In terms of once you're on our campus, support and resources will be there if you realize that you found another place to call home. However, at Carnegie Mellon, some options may be more difficult to enter than others. So there's no guarantee, for example, that if you were admitted and enrolled under our science college, the Mellon College of Science, that you're gonna be able to transfer to, let's say, computer science. There's no guarantee that you're gonna be able to transfer into the, a specific college that you might have on your mind. Uh, but again, we will always put resources and support to make sure students can find a home if they realize the one college that they're in no longer is the right fit for them. But some colleges are much more closed off and some programs are much more closed off than others. Nils, some co-op questions. Does co-op extend the graduation date from four years? Yeah, so, um, so co-op is, again, a six-month period at Northeastern. Co-op is a six-month period of full-time work for our students. It is not credit-bearing at Northeastern, so it is a great way for students to see what's out there. It's a great way to uh, utilize those skills, learn new skills to bring back into the classroom, but you don't earn any credit for it. It doesn't count towards your major, your minor, or anything like that. Uh, what that can mean is that it can extend your graduation date. Uh, typically our students are on a four or a five year track with four year students typically taking on one or two co-ops. Five year students are typically taking on two or three. We try to make it as easy as possible for students to have full flexibility in terms of which track they're choosing. Uh, so for example, if any of you are taking uh, AP classes right now, we'll take fours and fives on all your AP exams. As transfer credit, they reduce your graduation requirements, but many students will use those uh, to open up gaps. If you're typically taking four classes at a time during a semester, and you come in with four fours on AP exams, you have now opened up a full semester to take co-op, still keep all your summer vacations, uh, keep everything else in line and graduate within four calendar years. For students who are thinking about a four and a half or a five year track, it is important to keep in mind though at Northeastern when you're thinking about a five year track, that fifth year is not a fifth year of tuition. Students aren't earning credit while they're out on co-op. You're not paying tuition. In fact, most of the time you're earning money while you're out on co-op, uh, but that fifth year is simply a calendar year uh, with the opportunity to be graduating with either a year or even a year and a half of full-time work. Uh, so what I like to tell students too, if you're you know, scared of that fifth extra year, uh, if you graduate after five years with 18 months of full-time work experience, compared to someone who goes to a more traditional university and gets a job the day they graduated, on your graduation date, you might be six months ahead based on your resume having that 18 months of full-time work experience and eight semesters worth of classes that we just split up a little bit differently. So it can affect the schedule of graduation a little bit, but it doesn't, again, add that expensive fifth year. Um, it doesn't extend your time in the classroom or um, on campus necessarily. So at North Allegheny, we have over 50 classes that we call college and high school, similar to dual enrollment, but the kids are taking the classes here from our teachers. They are accredited by local colleges and universities. Just by show of hands, do you accept dual enrollment or college and high school? Do you accept college and high school credits? Mostly yes, some ish. We always tell the kids it does depend. Um, could everybody zip through and tell us your average SAT, ACT, GPA? So for us, uh, I'm not gonna go through and read all six uh, different colleges because we read by college within, uh, within the university. Each college actually has its own separate um, average. So 
if you actually go on our website, you'll be able to see the averages for, for example, the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences versus the School of Computer Science versus you know, our uh, Tepper School of Business. We have different averages when it comes to those colleges. So if you're trying to get a feel of where you might fall within our holistic review process, that would be the best way. Go specifically to that college. On our admission uh, website, we have a breakdown of that. Uh, so at uh, Northeastern, we measure everything in the middle 50%. Uh, so 25% of st students scoring above, 25% of students scoring below. Uh, on the SAT this past year, it was between a 1450 and a 1550. On the ACT, a 32 to a 34. Uh, and on a, a GPA scale of our own internal recalculation, um, where it's about a 4.0 scale with a 0.5 bump for honors classes and a full point bump for AP classes was between a 4.1 uh, and a 4.4. But again, we're taking into account the holistic review. Um, so those numbers are not by any means bare minimums. Uh, they're just kind of a good target to think of in terms of profile. Uh, similar to what uh, Miguel was mentioning with Carnegie Mellon, uh, there is differences based on which college a student is applying for. But uh, for our overall mid 50% for last year's overall uh, admission pool, uh, that fell in between on the SAT uh, mid 50% range, 1400 to 1500, ACT in between 32 and 34. The grade point average is a little bit more confusing with us not recalculating grade point averages. So it could be very different at this school versus a, a, a school down the street, but I always describe this as a pretty solid A minus performance. So whatever GPA numbers equate to that uh, over here, um, that's what you should be aiming for. Uh, when we measure rigor, I, I, I guess I can also disclose that the typical student who's been admitted to Villanova has uh, completed about five advanced placement classes with some uh, a pretty strong honors background on top of that as well. At UF, our, we do the middle 50%, um, so our GPA is a 4.1 to a 4.6. Um, that's just because we recalculate and reweigh classes. Our ACT is a 1360 to a 1420, and then our ACT is a 29 to a 33. I didn't realize there was going to be a test. <laughs> Um, I know that uh, many of you picked up one of the, uh, the Penn State brochures, so you can check my numbers to make sure that I'm right. Um, we break it down between University Park and all other campuses. GPA is about a 3.5 to a 4.0 at University Park, about a 3.1 to a 3.6 at all other campuses. SATs, I think it's about a 12.70 to a 14.10, something like that at University Park. Uh, at all other campuses, it's about a 1070 to a 1250, 12 something, I don't know. And I don't even want to begin to remember ACT because we don't talk about that a whole lot here in Pennsylvania, but we do accept it. And you can check the brochure for the actual numbers. Um, at The Rock uh, last year, the average GPA was a 3.47, uh, 1088 on the SAT, and a 22 on the ACT. I would also like to add that we, at least at UF, we re, we will super score the SAT and the ACT. That's my know. next question. Raise uh, of hands, who super scores? So, so Penn Everybody State does. Everybody but you, Dan. Penn State does not super right. score. That may change in the future, but for now, we do not super score. And we super score the SAT, but do not super score the ACT currently. And can somebody tell us what a super score is? Yes, sure. Uh, so uh, for SuperScore, basically what we're, what we're doing is we're, let's say you take the SAT, you've taken it at multiple iterations. We're gonna, for those subsections, we're gonna basically grab the highest scores from those different administrations of the test to produce a super score uh, that we'll use to be able to evaluate your application uh, for the ACT. It would be a, a similar thing as well. Raise of hands, who considers legacy in the admission process, a parent who attended? Thank you. A lot of questions, and this is always a hard one, around honors and AP classes. The age old A and an honors versus B and an AP, rigor classes, weighted, unweighted, how many honors and AP, and managing all of the stress of our students. So I know that's a big one, and I know it varies with all of your schools, but if we could get a few people to just touch on what's realistic. 
I, I think uh, the, the joke among a lot of admission counselors is that we would tell you get the A in the AP class, but I don't think that's very helpful for, for many students. And so um, I think a question that you can't ask uh, us as admission counselors is really, you know, what type of rigor is getting admitted at that school? And again, over at Villanova, uh, you know, typically about five APs is what, what students are doing. And that being said, um, you know, if you are not a great math student, you know, if you just barely pass pre-calculus, should you be signing up for AP calculus to get that fifth AP in there? I don't think that will be doing you any, any sort of service. Uh, you can certainly get to five APs in other subject matter uh, that you're stronger at. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say at Villanova that we would prefer to see the A's. Um, if you are skating by through all your college prep classes, uh, you know, b barely, uh, you know, studying and you're getting A's, then yeah, I think you should be stepping it up to honors AP classes at that point. But I think, you know, some real conversations with the teachers that are teaching those classes and your guidance counselors would be helpful to understand if you could be successful in those honors and AP classes. I think the only thing that I would add to that is to consider the competitiveness of the applicant pool that you're going into. It's a realistic piece of what happens um, within our process. Uh, the competition within a certain pool may be so much that it will raise a lot of the standards and a lot of the expectations. However, even the transcript review is a holistic review. So you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot that, that will overall uh, be measured within there. And then something else that we really focus on when it comes to curriculum and performance within there is ultimately we want students to be successful on our campus in the in the program that they're going to come in under. Uh, so we're going to take a look to see, okay, what what did you have available to you? How did you perform within that space? Uh, but then also, what are you going to be taking your freshman year? And do we think that you're going to be able to be successful in that space based off the rigor that was available to you and uh, as well as, as that specific grade? So we're not necessarily expecting that everyone produces perfect results, uh, but, but of course, ultimately, can we decipher, will you be successful in that freshman year? And that's, that's a really vital piece. Thank you so much. This actually ends the time that we have to ask our reps the questions that you submitted. A lot of you did ask questions about what should my freshman be doing? What should my junior be doing? When should we apply for college? A lot of these questions can be answered by your school counselor and on our school website, um, the school counseling website. So we would definitely encourage you to look on the NASH school counseling website and the NAI school counseling website we have checklists for every grade to show you what your students can be doing in each um, 9, 10, 11, 12th year to help them prepare for their college applications. And for those of you asking when should my student apply to college, that will be their senior year. And um, if they have any questions relating to their journey, what they should be doing, how they start their process, we want to know your children and we want to help them through this process. So please use your school counselor as much as you can. If you had specific questions about the um, colleges represented today, again, we would encourage you to email their admissions office and ask them the questions that you have. They have amazing people working there that can help you answer your specific questions. Would someone on the panel mind just advancing to one more slide? Thank you. How many, show of hands from our panel, how many of you will be at the NACAC Fair this week? Everybody but no. Aww. All right, so we wanted to let you know that there is a college fair this week downtown at the convention center. It is an excellent fair for students to go and meet with hundreds of representatives from colleges all over our country. We would definitely encourage your, our students to attend either Thursday. There are two sessions. One is in the school day, 9 a.m. to noon. If you don't wanna miss school or you can't, there is an evening event this Thursday from 6.30 to 9. And then there's also another um, session, February 7th, which is Friday from 9 to noon. Definitely encourage you to get out there um, if you haven't ever been to a fair, it can be a little bit intimidating, but we encourage you to just walk up to the table and say hello, tell them who you are, where you go to school, and maybe ask them what they're known for, or um, tell them a little bit about what you're interested in and ask if they have anything that fits your interests. They want to get to know you as much as you want to get to know them, so please take that opportunity to do that.
I think that's everything that we had for this evening. Could we please have a round of applause for our panel? You all were wonderful. So that concludes the evening. I know our reps have to get to their uh, hotels. So it's been a long day for them. So thank you everyone for coming.